with the Living History Project. Today we're interviewing Mr. Philip Gurevich, author of the recent book entitled Remarkably, We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Families, Stories from Rwanda. The interviewers today are Tammy Holtman, Director of the Center for Africa and the Media and Executive Director of Africa News Service. She prepared a study of the U.S. media coverage of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. I am Madeline Morris, the second interviewer. I'm a professor of law here at Duke Law School and served as advisor on justice to the president of Rwanda from 1995 until 97. Welcome. Thank you. We will have a free-flowing conversation, we hope, but maybe we should start with your just some basic introductory remarks about your view of the causes and aftermath, including a quick uh, forward up until today uh, of the story of the genocide of 1994. Well, the story of Rwanda, essentially, is um, that in what we focus on, and the reason that we talk about Rwanda now is that in the month of April, on April 6, 1994, uh, a program of massacres sparked by the state, led and presided over by the state in Rwanda, claimed the lives in the course of about 100 days of as many as a million people, at least 800,000. Uh, the killing was done low-tech by machete, by handheld instruments of a largely agrarian society, and presided over by civic and community leaders, military leaders, the state apparatus, but what made the scale of this extraordinary killing possible was that a lot of seemingly ordinary civilians were mobilized to participate in it. Where did all of this come from? How did it happen? How did it happen so fast? And why did it seem at that time to take us by surprise? Are huge, big questions. Um, hard to uh, do too, in, too briefly, but, but let me try and say that essentially the, the recorded written history of Rwanda begins about 100 years earlier, in 1894, when the first European came in. It's not the beginning of Rwandan history, but Rwandans didn't have an alphabet of their own had, and were not recording their history and writing. They, were, they had very strong oral traditions. At that time, the society was one of the very few societies that continues to this day to exist in the same borders that it existed in then. In sub-Saharan Africa, most of the states were carved up under colonialism. There was this self-contained kingdom, the Kingdom of Rwanda. It was presided over by a king called the Mwami, um, and it roughly was organized in the way that it is organized today. People living in villages, the villages having leaders, the leaders responding to their regional chieftains, their chief, regional chieftains responding upward and upward to the central court. And there were two groups of people in this society, roughly speaking. There was a group called the Tutsi and there was a group called the Hutu. The Tutsi were a minority and they were in power. They were the elite, they were the kings as well as much of the court, and they were the wealthier and uh, classes as well as the military classes in the country. And the Hutu basically constituted the rest, which is to say the peasant masses. Um, there were some physical differences between them, sometimes striking, sometimes if one looks at it across a, a gradation, not very hard to discern. Um, and there, they were essentially that the Tutsi were taller and more slender and perhaps more fine-featured and more European-looking in the sense that they had uh, narrower, more pronounced noses and thinner lips. And the Hutu were generally, stereotypically, squatter and flatter-nosed, thicker-lipped, and slightly darker. To the Europeans who arrived, this constituted a racial difference. One saw these n differences, and you saw that one small elite was in charge, and that this elite happened to look no less more like Europeans than those who were oppressed. And these were the, the sort of Negroid masses who were an inferior race. The Europeans came with these kind of Victorian and late 19th century ideas of race science. And what were the Tutsi and the Hutu? It's not entirely clear. They were classes, they were castes. But what's interesting is that today, hardly any ethnographers or historians accept the classification of tribes or ethnicities because they lived intermingled, they intermarried, they had no territorial distinctions, they worshipped the same gods, respected the same political systems, ate the same food, and in every way spoke the same language, in every way constituted one social, economic, political kind of 
culture, a cohesive culture. The biggest difference was this economic and political power difference. The Europeans in colonizing exploited, as they so often did, a small ruling class, in this case the Tutsi elites, and harnessed them as overlords over the, to, to essentially administer the colony for them. And in doing so, they also imposed their race science. They started to measure cranial capacities and uh, create indexes by which they could determine which nose was uh, flatter and which nose was longer, and to measure height and so forth, and to come up with this very scientific seeming, of course it was fraudulent science, but the scientific seeming way of categorizing these two people in a way that was not all that different even from some of the mentality that went into the Nazi race codes or the apartheid race codes, they imposed a system of uh, ethnic identification cards so that every Rwandan would carry a card that identified him by the 30s uh, as Hutu or Tutsi um, or Twa, which is the pygmy uh, population, which is less than half a percent and therefore politically insignificant. And by the time of the late 50s, you had a very entrenched, corrupt Tutsi elite monarchy and then you had this sort of Hutu mass. The numbers by then had been codified with this card system so that you had about 85% of the population was Tutsi, 15% Hutu. And as the winds of change came to the continent... You mean 15% Tutsi and 85% Hutu? I'm sorry. 15% Tutsi, 85% Hutu. And as change was coming to the continent and the questions of independence arose, the attitude suddenly was, well, you know, really the only fair system here would be to reverse this. It should be majority rule. It should not be minority rule. This is an oppressive and unjust system, which indeed it was. And so instead of trying to think, well, maybe there's a problem in having this divisive ethnic identity, nobody thought of that. What they thought is majority rule would mean Hutu domination. And a revolution came about in the late 50s. And this was the first instance of organized political violence of any kind between Hutus and Tutsis. Suddenly there were violent confrontations, the Hutu masses were organized to rise up in small groups around the country to torch Tutsi homes and to drive Tutsis out, to kill Tutsis, and you had this overthrow. The monarch fled, the, uh, many of the elites fled, many of the peasants also fled because there were lots of Tutsi peasants. And what was installed in 1962 in the name of a democratic majority regime was in fact a Hutu dictatorship uh, that kept itself in power largely by mobilizing the population at times of dissatisfaction to once again oppress the Tutsis. And there were periods of great oppression and periods of relative stability in the ensuing 30 years when two dictators, one after the other, ruled Rwanda. And when all military power was held by Hutu, Tutsi were limited uh, to very strict quota systems in their access to education and so on, and large numbers, hundreds of thousands of Tutsis from the beginning of the 60s till, say, the mid-80s had fled the country. And most of them settled in the surrounding states, Uganda, Zaire, uh, Tanzania, and in Burundi, where, of course, they had children, and those children combined with them came over time to constitute a really almost a million people, perhaps more, in this rather broad-based Rwandan diaspora. They kept agitating to come home. They kept, at different times, coming up with various forms of representatives who would come and ask the people in Kigali, the dictatorship there, can we come back? We are Rwandan refugees, excluded. Because although some of them were relatively well received in the neighboring countries, Africa has generous refugee policies, but they have no idea like American naturalization. You are always a Rwandan living as a refugee, always in exile. You have no new nationality. And so you're always a minority and a, and a foreigner. They wanted to come home, and they were always kept out. And so in the early 90s, a group of them in Uganda organized an army called the Rwandese Patriotic Front and launched a military campaign aimed at largely at achieving a power-sharing relationship with the regime in Rwanda and demanding that the right of return to refugees and the integration of armies and the end to sort of the polarized ethnic state created a civil war. And it was against the backdrop of this civil war that all of the political rhetoric that had been building since the 1950s and it was in place for oppressing Tutsi, for dehumanizing Tutsi, for periodically attacking and massacring Tutsi or, or burning them down, uh, had, was, was sort of ratcheted back up towards the rhetoric that became 
the movement and the, and the political mobilization of the genocide in 1994. That's roughly speaking, very abruptly speaking, where it came from. In 1993, the civil war was brought to a halt. By then, the president, President Juvenal Habyarimana, and his immediate ruling entourage, uh, who became to be known collectively, as it were, as Hutu power, but constituted a number of different political factions, they had launched very large militias, uh, recruiting from a large group of uh, unemployed youth in the cities and throughout the provinces, and had sought systematically to, to make more extremist every aspect of Rwandan political life in terms of the division of Hutu and Tutsi. There were practice massacres, there was increasing violence, there was a tremendous amount of tension. In 93, a peace deal was struck. And very interestingly, it was not the threat of war, but the threat of peace that sparked the final mobilization to genocide because the peace deal was for power sharing. It was essentially a victory for the rebels politically because it said power must be shared not only between Hutu and Tutsi but between this Hutu clatch who had power and all of the rival Hutu political parties. And it was against that backdrop that this small entrenched elite said we must hold on to power. How do we hold on to power? By creating this taking this us and them system that's in place and actually polarizing it more and more so that any Hutu who is not with us, we will classify as a Tutsi, an accomplice of the Tutsis. We will unify the Tutsis as a pure us against a pure them and ratchet that rhetoric up to kill or be killed. And it was against that backdrop that this, this took place. The killing uh, began. It was at first concentrated in the capital. The first day or two were focused on killing the political opposition as opposed to the general Tutsi population, focusing on particularly Hutu oppositionists, in other words, eliminating the internal Hutu polity that would oppose or resist the genocide and who had contacts abroad. Uh, and it was against, once that was done, it was very systematically spread throughout the country. The political leaders of this, the, the president was assassinated on April 6th, and essentially he was assassinated it appears, by members of his entourage. The exact perpetrators aren't known, but within half an hour, an even more extremist government was in place, and that was the government of the genocide. And this government of the genocide sent its ministers around to all the provinces where they gave speeches and whipped up the mobs to kill. And where there was a recalcitrant governor or a lazy mayor or an unmotivated civic leader who didn't want to kill his people, they would replace him and put in somebody who would, or they would put sufficient pressure on him that in the weak, uh, weaknesses of the time, people then participated. And the bodies were piling up at a rate of, by my calculation, five and a half per minute nonstop for every day of the hundred days uh, following April 6th. Eventually, the Rwandese Patriotic Front, these rebels who pursued their war through the whole killing period, was able to sort of chase out the government of the genocide and take power. The next chapter of this story is a two-year period, I would say, in which the new government tried to establish some kind of control, and a million and a half to two million people had fled the country, these being the Hutu leaders who had organized the genocide as well as their militia and military then tried to take as much of the population with them into exile to create a power base in exile and essentially established a rump Rwandan state in refugee camps supported by the United Nations. Uh, and countless humanitarian organizations, where they rearmed, retrained, recruited, and became this massive force dedicated to genocide that was aiming to reinvade Rwanda. In 96, they were primarily based, I should say, in Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, where the dictator Mobutu was one of their great patrons. And in 1996, Rwanda launched a backed, a seed force, a rebellion in Zaire, aimed at knocking out the camps, driving the refugees home, driving those who were committed to fighting either deeper into Zaire or as far afield as possible. And ultimately, this was the rebellion that then unseated the dictator Mobutu Sese Seko in, in the spring of 1997. And now we have a next chapter, which is that of the original genocidal forces, tens of thousands continued to flee each successive campaign and resettle in new camps this time surrounding the Congo further afield in the Central African Republic and Congo Brazzaville and Angola, uh, up into the Sudan. They went to the uh, Islamic Jihad regime there in the Sudan and started settling in. They made alliances with some of the 
more obscene uh, terrorist groups in Uganda, like the Lord's Resistance Army, and infiltrated there. And so you had tens of thousands of them by United Nations estimates, at, still active, still committed to genocide, still floating around. And the new government that replaced Mobutu in the Congo, Kabila failed in any way to bring them under control or to protect the border, which was Rwanda's main concern. And so some of them also returned into Rwanda, and Rwanda became deeply destabilized in that period after the closing of the camps. Last summer, in the summer of 1998 in August, Rwanda once again backed a rebellion in Zaire, now the Congo. And this time, their policy with Uganda was essentially, so far, has been to create a buffer zone. They've pushed the front deep into the Congo. And the eastern Congo, which had been the staging ground for these attacks by the genocidal forces on Rwanda, uh, is significantly less of a threat to Rwanda. It's still itself a very unstable area. But inside Rwanda, the reports since August of 98, and particularly since this current war in the last six months as we speak, has been that Rwanda has been very, very much calmer a country where it was unsafe and people didn't want to drive around from village to village or take minibuses because there were ambushes, a country where there are hundreds of thousands of internally displaced people. Those people are beginning to be resettled. There are actually, the week, right now as we speak, for the first time since the genocide, local elections being held in Rwanda, the first local elections uh, since the genocide, and the first that are attempting to create something of a non-ethnic state. That's the challenge. And uh, that's the sort of very, very broad cursory thumbnail of the story. Last week, United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan proposed that there be an independent commission of inquiry to investigate the role of the United Nations in the events of 1994, presumably including his own role in those events or, or lack of it. Would you talk a little bit about how you see the role of the United Nations? Well, there's a lot to investigate. Kofi Annan is right about that. And he's called for this investigation, which the Security Council has now approved, um, because he's been under tremendous pressure over time to somehow or other explain what the United Nations did and why during the build-up to the genocide and afterwards. I mentioned that there had been a peace deal struck in 1993 between the warring parties in Rwanda. One of the chief conditions of that deal was that a UN peacekeeping force, Blue Helmets, would be deployed to Rwanda to preside over the, what was then imagined to be a transition period towards this new regime. And the force arrived. It arrived a couple of months late. It arrived in this incredibly tense, polarized atmosphere. And, you know, United Nations peacekeeping forces don't have intelligence capacities. So they started trying to buy beers for Rwandan military, get to know anybody they could and get information. And by early January, the force commander had a source very high up in the presidential security apparatus who explained to him basically a blueprint plan of how the genocide was being planned and what was intended. The Tutsis were being registered, that they were to be exterminated, that the, uh, he gave an example of his men were being trained to kill a thousand Tutsis in 20 minutes. That, and this source thought this was a terrible idea. He did not oppose fighting an armed military enemy with your military, but the idea of systematic slaughter of all civilians in a minority group, that bothered him. And so that's why he was leaking to the UN. The force commander, Romeo Dallaire, a major general from Canada, sent this information to the peacekeeping headquarters at the UN in New York, which was then being presided over by Kofi Annan. He was the head of peacekeeping before he became secretary general. He sent this information in an urgent cable asking for permission to protect the informant. That's all he asked for. He said, how do I help protect this guy so he keeps giving us information and I intend to take action? And Kofi Annan's office told him not to. And essentially they lost their source. They did nothing. And that was systematically the pattern up until April 6th. One of the things he was also told at the time of this fax, the famous fax that Dallaire sent that day, was that the plan to spark the genocide was to assassinate some Rwandan political leaders and then to kill a number of Belgian Blue Helmets. They were the chief Western contingent within the UN force uh, with the idea that they would then withdraw the entire force. That if you kill some of these UN soldiers, they won't have the stomach for fighting and they'll withdraw. This is, of course, one has to remember just a few months, six months after uh, the American soldiers were killed in Somalia and the world had a very low appetite for these peacekeeping missions. This is exactly what happened. On April 7th in the morning, 10 Belgian blue helmets were seized. 
taken prisoner, tortured, murdered, mutilated, and within a week the entire mission had collapsed. The UN pulled out. Now, Kofi Annan and his people, when you go and talk to them and say, so how did this happen and why did you uh, fail so totally to recognize this extraordinary language. If you talk to people who read UN cables, they don't get many cables that say, we believe in this for source. This source says extermination. It's a word they hadn't seen there since World War II, government planned extermination. Why did they fail so totally to register this? They blame the member states of the United Nations. What the Secretariat does is they say, well, you see, we are really, the UN is only able to do what the Security Council, what the great powers that sit on the Security Council authorize us to do. We did what was within our very by-the-book mandate. So in other words, bureaucratically, they simply did the most narrow sclerotic interpretation of what their obligations were. Did they try to drum up attention? No. Did they in any way try to make noise? No. They simply kept their heads down. It's true that in April, the United States, as the great power on the Security Council, did a great deal to obstruct any further action and strongly encouraged the withdrawal of the force. So it's true that there's plenty of blame to go around. But the investigation of the UN is the UN were the ones who were there. They keep saying that they're incapable of doing anything. And yet, they were the presence. And I think that the real debate that this has sparked is the question of the false promise of protection that's implied by their presence. And for Rwandans whom I spoke with, one of the things that they kept saying when you'd say, well, look, you know, if you look very closely and the more minutely you look, the more, the more dramatic and exaggerated it becomes, the more minutely you look at life in Rwanda in the months before the genocide, the more it seems the whole thing was announced, it was scripted. You can read the newspapers and they were basically announcing it. You listen to the radio broadcast, they were announcing it. Why didn't you leave, you'll say to Tutsis. And they say, well, among other things, it's hard to uproot your family. You think, my old mother, I'll stay here and try and protect her. And the UN was here. We knew it might get worse, but we didn't think it could get absolutely worse. And there are these extraordinary scenes that were played out where the UN blew helmets. When the killing began, they'd have a base, let's say, at a school. And thousands of people seeking protection would come to that base. And then a week later, the blue helmets were removed, the people were left behind in a concentration, and they were slaughtered. That's what the investigation has to be able to answer, how that came about. We have so little time, unfortunately. Um, and I will selfishly, and maybe not inappropriately, ask for us to address issues of justice, post-genocide justice. Mm -hmm. I say selfishly because that's, that's an area of, of my greatest interest. The immediate post-genocide period was, um, well, let's see, in November of 95, uh, there was, as you know, a conference in Kigali on the question of where should the government go from here and, mm -hmm. and justice was one of the, the big issues addressed and you know all of this but just for um, uh, context, uh, an organic law on how to address the genocide um, prosecutions or justice after genocide was developed that relied largely on a confession and plea bargaining approach. Unknown prior to that in Rwandan or most civil law contexts, um, but what, w what which was going to be relied on heavily uh, to, to try to address and balance all of the different issues, the enormous number of prisoners, um, first of all. Um, since that time, that, that law was enacted on September 1st, 96, and since that time has not been implemented, um, more or less, um, there's been there have been a handful, a few hundred uh, prosecutions under that law. Um, several thousand um, guilty pleas have been received, but they've not been acted upon. Uh, they not, they've not been resulted, uh, they've not resulted in convictions, and more significantly, the reduced sentences haven't mm -hmm. been applied in return for the guilty pleas. The uh, Minister of Justice of Rwanda for 96 to 98 uh, recently resigned in um, more or less in despair um, over the enormous amount of obstructionism uh, in attempting to move forward with justice processes. Um, little of this, in my observation, little of this is covered um, in at least the American press, um, partly I think because the source for information for 
most of 96, 97, 98 was the second in command at the Ministry of Justice, Gerald Gehima, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, influential, very RP, centrally RPA, Rwandan Patriotic, uh, or RPF, Rwandan Patriotic Front, uh, player. And, and so the, the idea that this justice processes were being obstructed, that there was a lack of political will to go forward, that there was a great deal of political conflict within the government on justice wasn't reflected. Um, and that perhaps has even influenced the um, foreign policy of U.S. and other donor countries who have poured quite a lot of money into uh, the Rwandan uh, Ministry of Justice. Mm -hmm. So that, that, with that situation as sort of a, a backdrop, um, how, do you, how do you view, how, uh, first of all, are you even in, in accord with that analysis and how do you view how we've come to this part in terms of justice with 135,000 prisoners um, being held and how do you see uh, the way forward? The, I think that basically the, the, story, the story is as you describe it, which is to say that almost immediately after the genocide, people started to become, be, be arrested. On one level, I think that that's remarkable. The simpler thing to do would be to kill them. And it's hard at a time like that to assume that you're going to have a rebel army coming in and showing the restraint and showing the faith in the idea that there will ultimately be institutions that at that time didn't exist to deal with prisoners and to deal with prisoners in a way that would actually satisfy the societal need to come to terms with some sense that this crime could to a degree be punished. It's an impossible crime to punish. 800,000 murders. There is no way, even with the organic law, that the American legal system could just sort, of, sort of swiftly and efficiently conduct 800,000 trials with any degree of due process that would be sort of meet, meet a minimum international standard in any kind of dis, with any kind of dispatch. And Rwanda simply doesn't have the technological, and by that I mean they don't have the bikes and the motorcycles and the pencils and the pens. They may now have some more of that, but for quite a while it was just very difficult to collect in evidence. So arrests were made. The arrests themselves were often made on terribly shoddy grounds. There were also killings, of course. There were revenge killings, but they tapered off rather abruptly by the end of 1995 to become a, an essentially piecemeal and uh, sort of occurrence. And there were people who were even arrested for some of those. Relatively few, by no means can one be sure that they were the right people again. So you have this terribly complicated situation. The very idea of trying to have trials, to me, suggests uh, an expression of good faith that is probably what the policy of the West, uh, the, the American government and so forth, was responding to when they supported the justice system. There was a lot of conflict. There were people who felt that they didn't want to execute everybody who was responsible for conducting murders in Rwanda. And they didn't, at the same time, want to not execute them. I think it's that simply put. To not execute them meant what? To keep them alive and perhaps to let them go free. For many people in the government, it wasn't simply a question of accounting for those murders. It was also a question of how to dismantle a political force that threatened to remain very strong. Here were, as I've said before, tens of thousands in exile dedicated to this genocide. Here were 100,000 some odd in prison. They may not all be guilty. Probably a sizable chunk of them, if they weren't guilty before, are at least loyal to the disposition of this genocidal opposition. So I think one doesn't have to make any excuses for the current government. And one doesn't have, I think it's totally disappointing that more hasn't been accomplished. And at the same time, one has to try to understand how utterly complicated it would be to do it. One of the things that struck me is even in these few hundred per prosecutions is that the sentences that have been handed out vary quite dramatically. They're not rubber stamp sentences. How do you judge the independence of the judiciary in a system like this? It's one of the few ways you can do it. To say, look, they brought 10 people before the court at once and they got divergent sentences and nobody can really explain to us a system by which that's corrupt. <laughs> In other words, it actually seems it might have something to do with the cases. You can't say, well, that guy got two years because his mother's best friend is the judge's best friend. That guy got eight years because the judge wanted his cow or whatever, which 
At times is how Rwandans explain these things. It's a society of tremendous intrigue. It's a society that does have this tremendously centralized administration, and at the same time, all life is intensely local. People live in these units of 10 houses, uh, and those units of 10 houses are built into villages and in the villages into communes. And that's where 90% of the people really have no experience of a national government, except insofar as it's expressed locally. So even Gerald Gahima, who was the deputy minister of justice and this RPF man who was the voice of the justice ministry, he would often point to me, point me in the direction of stories of tremendous corruption within the Justice Administration. Um, they got awfully arcane. And as a reporter for a weekly magazine, which I was writing for maybe two, three times a year from Rwanda, it was impossible to get into most of them because it was so intricate. But it would be, you know, this mayor in this town, I would be being told, was all, several Human Rights Watch people, or not Human Rights Watch the organization, but Human Rights Watchers would tell me, you should watch out for him. You've been down there in that town. He's the mayor. He's a survivor. He is totally corrupt. He's railroading Hutus to justice. Then you'd go somewhere else. You'd find out that, in fact, this guy was totally corrupt, not because he was railroading Hutus to justice, but because he was allowing wealthier Hutus who were more responsible for the genocide to buy their way out of jail. When it, this is a survivor, allowing perpetrators to go free, known perpetrators, while weaker cases were kept in the jail. So then you start to think, well, is this a national program? Is this something that you can judge on a national scale? Can you say, then you go to the minister, and you say to the minister, well, you know about this problem. Yes, I do. Why don't you do anything? If I do something about that, then I have the survivors breathing down my neck, because this guy's a survivor. And because every one of these cases is tremendously, tremendously complicated. And so I think that our expectations have to be, unfortunately, very low. I think that's the problem. And the trick is how to make your expectations low while constantly, without bashing the government for making an effort, without alienating it so that you remain some leverage, at the same time not become an apologist for it and keep some pressure on saying, you've got to do better. That's the trick. And I think the best pressure is going to have to come from inside. It's going to be political pressure. Let me ask you a two-part question about the role of media and the media coverage of, of 94 and the historical context which was or was not provided. You've talked about the importance of memory in, as the centrality of memory in understanding the present and facing the future. Um, one of the characteristics of the media coverage was that there was no recent or long-range historical context in terms of regional, recent historical context. Uh, there was very little mention, if at all, for example, of the killings of over 100,000 to 200,000 Hutu in neighboring Burundi in 1972-73, which formed part of the fabric of the climate that enabled a people to be organized to commit genocide. Um, and in terms of more long-range things, something you've talked about a lot, the lack of any sense of, of uh, organized state genocide rather than ancient tribal rivalries, the Hamitic myth that you've talked about. So I wonder if you would talk about those two kinds of instances and what role you see media playing in limiting or framing the possibilities or the decisions of policymakers to intervene or not to intervene. There's no question that as an American news consumer, which is all I was in relationship to Rwanda during the genocide, I didn't start going until a year later. It was incredibly difficult to make any sense of what was going on while it was going on. On the other hand, here we are. You both know a lot about this. We're having a conversation all amongst people who know a great deal about it. We have 45 minutes to talk about it in, and we're staying on a fairly hard to follow superficial level just by virtue of just it's an incredibly complicated story. In the defense of people whose job it was to whip out wire service stories at 600 words a day and who were seeing quite often the most appalling things, they would drive up to a roadblock in a Red Cross truck and just for kicks, some militia would pull the wounded off the truck and kill them in front of the reporters. The reporters are going to report that. That's going to take them 400 words to describe what they saw, which is the mo and to them, in some level, that's the loudest SOS they can send. At the end, it'll say, these were Tutsis, those were Hutus. They know that these names sound like Dr. Seuss names. Most of the reporters didn't know much about it because who was paying attention to Rwanda beforehand? Quite relatively few, and that's also explainable because their desks weren't asking for it. You know? It's not as if anybody was saying, you know, 
let's pay attention to this small, obscure country that doesn't seem to have any economic or strategic significance and find out what's happening so that if something does happen, we'll be well informed. The bureaus that cover East Africa or Central Africa for the New York Times, these are people who cover 11 countries for the Washington Post, for the major television stations. It's the same thing. They have to cover Somalia, Burundi, Rwanda, Sudan, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, perhaps Mozambique. These are all countries where at a given moment there's either an election, a coup d'etat, a drought, a major, major headline news story in two or three of those countries. So that explains to some extent why we get lousy coverage. Africa is not significantly on the news map even when it's not having a major event. So here comes a major event. I think that altogether there's insufficient historical context in covering the news. If you look at the Yugoslav coverage during the Bosnia War, it got better and better and better as you had reporters whose beat it was for two or three years. You had an intense press corps who, by virtue of competition and camaraderie combined, got totally invested in this story and lived it day and night. And after a while, you'd notice some of the better reporters who were regularly covering it would basically find these ways of framing 850 words of history lesson with 150 words of daily news instead of the other way around. And they made that their mission. But that took years. Look at the first 100 days of coverage from anywhere. The speed with which this genocide was carried out be, was an excuse provided by the perpetrators to everyone who was supposed to react that was quite good. It was quite a good excuse. We don't react that quickly to the situations we don't know already. We just don't. So I think that many of those journalists whose work might ultimately add up to look not so great were doing a tremendous job. Some of the wire service stories, if you go back and look at them, knowing what one knows now, they're very good capsules of what was happening on a given day. You, but you don't have the context to put it in. And so as a reader, the other decision I would, the other thing I would stress is it's, it's often I fault the editors. Editors are making the big decisions. They're deciding how much attention to pay to this. They're deciding whether to assign somebody in New York or Washington to sit down and go to the library and try and figure out where all this came from. In the few seconds that are left, how do you think that for whatever reason the the superficiality of the media coverage affected policy. It makes it easier to ignore something. I mean, the, the best way to make policy have to deal with a situation is to make it right in front of them all the time. And there's no question that the louder the clamor, the less ignorable it is. Call it the CNN factor, call it, you can do it in a newspaper too. It can even be done in a magazine. It, what needs to happen is you need a full and complete story that is consistent and stays in front of people that they can't get away from it. Why do you think Kofi Annan is now asking for an investigation of the UN role? Because he can't get away from it. He thought it would go away, and he's been proven wrong. You're one of the people who has kept this issue visible. How did you come to spend several years focusing on this? I went to write one article a year after the genocide, partly because I still wondered, how did this happen? How did something like this happen? And the language of it, chaos, anarchy, a collapsed state, none of that made sense. You can't kill 800,000 people in 100 days without a great deal of organization. That hadn't been explained. And how were people going to live with this? That question also really drew me. And then, of course, the rhetoric that we live with in public life, the moral rhetoric of never again, the rhetoric that somehow we all know that we stand against genocide, but we also let this happen in front of us without really coming to terms with it. It bothered me and it, made, it was stuck in my mind in a way that made me want to go and have a closer look.